Most of us can agree that water is a human right, and that it should be free. But why isn't it? Getting clean tap water into our homes costs money for many reasons, one of them being aging infrastructure. Water infrastructure is the system of water mains, pumping facilities, and service lines that form a network to bring water from Lake Michigan into our faucets. The system costs money to build and maintain. In addition, there's the cost of paying the employees that are needed to operate those facilities. Yes, perfect world, it should be free, but we've got to figure out a model where, where we get the money from because we can't expect every city to pay for it because they can't. Daniel's right. Cities have a lot of expenses, like budgeting for public education and maintaining public services. But in relation to water, there's a big one. Remember that infrastructure we were talking about earlier? Well, that infrastructure is aging, and it's aging badly. These old pipes are breaking down and starting to leak, and our government isn't doing much to fix it. Our infrastructure is aging, it's old, there's so many pipes that need to be replaced. Um, and the, the fact of the matter is we've been really cheap about fixing it. Even though this is a cost that needs to be paid, it's not being paid by the government anymore. On the federal level, um, a lot of the issues that we're seeing with privatization come from the fact that our federal government has really declined the amount of funding that they give for public water systems. So what I mean by that is in the late 1970s, our federal government was spending about $77 a person just for water infrastructure. Now that number has plummeted to something like $13. And so because of that, a lot of communities aren't getting the necessary funding to upkeep their water systems, replace pipes, et cetera. And because of that, they're not providing really good quality water. They don't have enough funding. And sometimes they're forced into this decision of privatizing their water, even though they may not want to, but they um, are acknowledging that maybe another entity can do a better job. Instead of the federal or state government's assistance, these extra costs from aging infrastructure are being burdened on the ratepayers. In addition, ratepayers have to pay the costs of water leaks due to faulty old systems. Because that infrastructure leaks a lot of water. And so there's actually communities that have to pay for those leaks in addition to uh, pay for the actual water that they use. But there's one more reason as to why water rates are so high, and that's privatization. Privatization is when private companies buy out public water systems, and so far it doesn't look like our water is in very good hands when it comes to privatization. Look, if I told you that the stock of a water utility was up more than 27% since the beginning of the year, would you actually believe me? You should. Because the stock I'm talking about is Aqua America. WTR, water for you home gamers. And Good to see you. Tim, how are you? Thanks All right, for so I'm me. trying to figure it out. I mean, you're a growth utility. There's only a couple of them. Um, and you get, get, you get the growth by a combination of those acquisitions, and you get rate increases, rate increases, rate increases, rate increases. For example, let's just say you have a municipality, they have a public water system. There can be one of a few options. So. Uh, maybe that municipality is having a hard time affording, maintaining that water infrastructure. Maybe people are complaining about bad water. And so they start to explore what it means to privatize a water system. And then the water department and city council and like city manager will work with the private water company to transfer operations and ownership. Um, by that point, the water company will take over the system and decide whether or not to keep the workers in that water system or to let them go to have their own and how to restructure um, the operations of the water system so as i mentioned before sometimes that can result in a loss of public sector jobs with one in three jobs being lost on average when municipalities privatize their water systems and then often after that we see um, a hike in rates afterwards and so what we've seen is that sometimes when people can't afford to pay those high water prices, their water gets shut off. Another um, barrier to that is getting your water turned back on. In some places, there's a charge of $100, $200, $500 to get your water back on. So that can put people in a really precarious economic position. Private water companies, right, they have a lot of resources. They're multi-billion dollar entities oftentimes, and they have lawyers that can work on crafting a really wonderful contract that's really great for them and not so great for the city. And so 
because of that, it's, the odds are really stacked up in their favor. And for people who want to reverse that contract, it's a really difficult job that can take years and even decades and sometimes. According to Genia, from what we've seen so far, water privatization can cause on average a loss of one in three public sector jobs and raised water rates. On top of all that, water privatization doesn't even guarantee better water quality, as in the case of Cleveland, Ohio. Fiji is actually one of the most notorious examples of marketing with the water bottle industry because in 2006, they targeted Cleveland, right? They released this ad you see and essentially they attacked the public water systems of Cleveland and tried to convince Cleveland citizens that they should buy Fiji water instead of drink from their public water. Cleveland took what they said, right, very seriously, and they actually tested their water for Fiji compared to their tap water. And they found Fiji water had arsenic, which actually is a toxic chemical. We can all agree that when it comes to our water, safety should be a number one priority, but that doesn't seem to be the case for these companies. Corporations, main um, goal is to increase their bottom line, is to remain profitable, because if they're not profitable, then they wouldn't exist. Um, they want to have bigger profits for their shareholders. And so for them, raising water is a, or raising water prices is a part of their business model. And it's very inseparable from that. So I would say absolutely corporations are culpable for that. And we see that all over the state of Illinois when um, corporations buy up water water systems and will just raise the prices overnight seemingly. Rate increases. It's not just corporations either who are to blame for this unjust spike in rates. The government is not only complicit, but accommodating towards many of these water companies. Illinois has laws in place that make it easier for corporations to buy up water systems. In Illinois, we have a law and that law actually it made it easier for these corporations to buy up systems. So what it said is like when Illinois American buys up, say Peoria, it says that, that this corporation could now pass the cost of buying up that system onto the people that are already their ratepayers. Which basically means these corporations are rounding up all these water systems and making us pay for them on top of paying our normal water rates. They're treating these water systems like they're Pokemon and they've got to catch them all. And I really don't think Pikachu deserves that kind of shock. But that's not the only problem here. There's also an equity issue at play. These high water rates are disproportionately affecting low-income communities, and it's not just because of privatization. You know, suburbs have to pay more for water to be transported away from Lake Michigan through a series of pipes. And there's a number of financial transactions that happen. For example, maybe um, the city of Chicago has initial ownership. It sells to County of DuPage. County of DuPage sells to another um, suburb. So every time there's that transaction, there's a markup. And so if you're geographically farther away from the lake, you pay more money. And we haven't even covered the racial disparity that's tied into all of this. In terms of Chicago suburbs, black communities pay 20% more for water than predominantly white communities, even if they're a similar distance away from the lake. And that's because of water infrastructure not being adequately, adequately maintained in communities of color, working communities, and black communities. Water is a basic human need. There should be no debate on that. And while we know that water can't be completely free, our government should be doing something to help stop the exploitation tactics that these companies are using to earn a profit. Part of the playbook, too, is to starve public funding and public operations, right? To starve social services, so then you have to turn to a corporation to fix it. But what can our government do? We can invest our money in cleaner water fountains instead of those bottled waters. But having the government reinvest our money is a statement that activists have been saying time and time again. What can we do to make sure that actually happens? So the more it gets in the news, the more people learn about it, the more community groups say, we're not going to stand for that and we're going to pressure the mayor, the more the mayor kind of has to respond. That's sort of like, the, like how you get a path to victory. And this can possibly even pave the way for new solutions, such as having... Different municipal water systems can actually band together to create um, entities that span more than one township, more than one municipalities. And if they're both from public entities, we call them public-public partnerships. So um, those can sometimes also play a role in delivering water. Um, and so when they're public, we um, support that as an organization because we think public entities merging their resources would make for better water quality and better delivery since they can pull their resources together. 
And so one of the things we want to get people thinking about is what's the fairest form of water distribution? And that would be to figure out a way to share the costs across the entire region. So just because you're a place that has your own water, that's great, um, but it's not fair that another place has to pay so much for water. So we should be sharing the costs. And in places that have more poor folks who can't afford it, we should be figuring out how to subsidize that so they can have access to water for cheaper. But we also need to get the word out because not many people even know what's going on. So we need to find a way to inform them. But what's cool about young people and how they organize is like, you know, as we're learning, like young people aren't willing to wait around for the world to just slowly come to terms with equity. And so like, it would be so cool if we see young people organizing around a fairer model of water affordability and saying, we want it now. So it's up to us to stand up and hold people accountable. But before that, it's also up to us to step up and teach people about this. Informing people is always like the first step, you know, kind of like they said, like, you can't hold people accountable if they don't know in the first place, right? Data alone isn't going to solve the problem. Like, you need people's stories, you need to connect on that human level. And once again, Daniel's right. Yes, we need to hold people accountable. Yes, we need to inform people. But above all, we need to connect with people on both sides to be able to tackle this issue head on. And hopefully one day we can have clean and equitable access to water for all.